So today we are here, um, DSM Forum, uh, and this is the DSM Forum UK Decoding NG17. And what does that mean um, for the uh, practice, for our clinical practice? We've got some special um, guests with us today. Firstly, I'd like to um, welcome our sponsors. So our gold sponsor today is uh, Glucoman, and they will be giving us a little chat in, in just a sec. And we also have our silver sponsor today, which is Dexcom. Um, and so we've got a couple of lovely guys <laughs> that will be sharing some, some uh, bits in a second. Um, so I'm going to go to the next slide. So this is our agenda. Firstly, uh, DSM Forum team will introduce ourselves and we'll go through the background. Um, then we will have Glucoman. Then we will have Dexcom and then Partha is going to join us. So uh, you guys, we don't need to introduce Partha. I don't think Partha is very well known in diabetes circles. Um, and Partha is uh, NHS from NHS England. And he will be chatting to us about what how the update, updated guidance came into, to, um, into fruition and all about, um, you know, how we can how we can work um, to get this actually working uh like as as he did with libra so cgm <laughs> all the updated stuff from that and then we'll have a panel discussion so this is where you've got chance to ask as many questions as you like um so please do start filling up that q a on the um zoom call if you're on the zoom please do put all your questions in for path or, or, or any of the team um at dexcom or, or glucom and they'll answer the questions as well um and uh if you are on facebook please do just put it in the comment section of this live stream and we will get it from there and we will ask the questions live um, so I'm just going to stop sharing for a second and just introduce everybody. So my name is Amanda Epps and I am a diabetes specialist nurse and I work at East Kent Hospitals. Beth, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi, I'm Beth Kelly and I'm one of the lead diabetes specialist nurses in Wiltshire. Tamsin? Tamsin, you're next. <laughs> hi, I'm Tamsin fletcher Soul, and I'm the team lead for the Royal State University Hospital. And I'm Vicky Alabraba. Um, I've got a background as a diabetes specialist nurse and I work within the Eden team at Leicester Diabetes Centre. We have Christian. Hello, I'm Christian. I work for Glucoman. I'm the National Product Manager. And Sam. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam, uh, one of the key sales managers for Dexcom. Right, so DSM Forum team, I'm just going to bring this up. When I bring this up, I can't actually see you, so <laughs> we'll uh, spin a bit. Good job you know what we look like. <laughs> right, I'm just going to go to the next slide. Right, so this is the background. Um, so when the first, this first sort of talk about Libra and CGMs becoming readily available, I think was in about 2015, 2016. Um, and that's when Libra became available to self-fund. Um, so some people were lucky enough to be able to um, self-fund that. And so there were some randomized controlled trials to show the benefits of, of FLASH. Um, and then in 27, 20, 2017 to 2018, this is where Beth and I met for the first time. <laughs> It does seem like yesterday, doesn't it? But I know, it's, I know. You were saying the other day, it's like a little bit of DSM Forum history and that we met going to the House of the Parliament, didn't we, for the first time. Um, and I feel like that was a real landmark kind of thing with the whole CGM slash and where we are today. Um, so D Diabetes UK got involved, didn't they? And they had the um, Fight for Flash campaign and we had lots of people going to Parliament um, to kind of debate the, the postcode lottery of it and... All that kind of stuff so I remember that's the first time I wrote a blog as well I think you did <laughs> we used to but yeah it was very nice so um, and then I think yeah 2018 is when it became available on the um, NHS drug tariff and we had the armok statement then didn't we which did give us some criteria um, so I think some of us had we still had some quite strict criteria about um, yeah. who could use it and that was some of us think, more than others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you were in a bit of a dodgy area, weren't you, for a while? <laughs> to say yeah. the least. I think we might have been the last uh, where, where I was previous to this job. Uh, we were like sort of the last area to, to be able to actually oh, get God. it. So that was that was quite quite a tricky time. But I'm trying to think in my head what the um, 
what the criteria was now it seems so long ago but uh, scanning yeah. eight times a day um occupational was well, yeah not Hypo. recognizing hypos all of those kind of it was quite it's quite a strict criteria i think at that time then we move on to 2019 obviously um at the beginning of 2019 you've got the uh, national nhs criteria which is launched with a minimum adoption percentage so this is where you know it was expected that people would be able to prescribe a minimum I think it started off at about 20% and it was you you should be prescribing 20% of your people with type 1 diabetes uh, flash um, and so that's when we were actually able to do it then because we, we were given the kind of go ahead and we we just as soon as we were given that go ahead we just went bam 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 and got <laughs> we we just like went right up and got everyone we could could on flash and that was that was brilliant and um, we also had the diabetes technology online modules were launched and that that really helped when covid kind of hit in, in sort of 2019 2020 because everything became virtual then didn't it so we all had to do everything virtually and having those modules just made it so much easier to teach people and and to get people to do it um themselves um Tamsin, did you have uh, much to do with the um with with giving offering pregnant women uh, uh, cgm in type one yeah so i mean obviously that came into effect um around about covid as well so it was a bit delayed because of that or certainly in our area we we should have started it i think in the april of 2020 and it got pushed back a little bit um but you know now we're you know as soon as we know we've got somebody that's got type 1 diabetes and and um is pregnant then you know we're immediately um talking to them about cgm and and getting them getting them started on it so um it's been amazing because obviously now you know the the data shows that you know, a, like a huge number, like nearly 100% of people with type 1 diabetes are offered, um, you know, CGM when they're pregnant. So, I mean, that's just amazing. Yeah, I think the latest in the present, when we if we, when we get onto the present, it's something like 97% now. So, it's absolutely brilliant. Um, Vicky, what about 2020 ABCD audit? Do you have anything to do with that at all or, or extending it to people with learning disabilities? Uh, so I was very much in, well, I was in a community role at, at that time. Um, so initially when um, it, it kind of all first started, we weren't actively using it because it was kind of done with the, in the secondary care team. But obviously as the, um, now, you know, the, the data shows sorry, that sorry. It was kind of <laughs> as um, things changed and we obviously, a lot of our patients that we saw um, were, um, kind of fitted that criteria at the time then we did start using it so we were involved in the audit data um, where I was working at the time I guess our numbers in the community probably weren't as as many as sort of the secondary care um, clinics but I imagine now in in the role that I was doing then there's more and more people obviously uh, using it out in in the community setting yeah but those audit papers were quite hefty weren't they I'm quite glad <laughs> we don't have to do those anymore because they were like triple sided. All the stuff we had to collect pre and post using the flash six yeah. month trial. Thing was but it was fun. worth it in the end because when it we was, get to 2021, yeah. now we got 55% coverage in people with type yeah. 1 diabetes. Thanks. And that's when the NICE consultation started for CGM. So, um, and the hybrid closed loop pilot. So, um, that that's going on ongoing at the moment and we're just waiting for the data analysis to come out hopefully partha might be able to fill us in a bit more about when we, we when we can expect the yeah. um, analysis for that to come out um, quite got it, maybe we'll yeah so we're on 97 percent of pregnant women now are being offered cgm which is absolutely amazing isn't it 97 percent type ones uh, are now getting offered cgm in pregnancy which is absolutely amazing now hopefully now that with the new nice guidance um they might be able to keep it <laughs> whereas you know with the previous it, it's been you get it for 12 months and then you you kind of you fit it's, it's whether you fit the criteria or not whereas now that we can have that uh, ongoing hopefully people will be able to to keep it now um, and we're up to 60 percent of people with type 1 on flash which is or cgm which is absolutely amazing yeah it really is isn't it so the nice guidance so where we are now so we obviously had ng28 came out first i think wasn't it um 
which was the type 2 diabetes guidance and then we had ng17 so they both came out this year and we've been waiting so long for this guidance to come out so as you can see on the left the ng17 which is the type 1 diabetes nice guidance um, says that we should be offering a choice of real time so real time continuous glucose monitoring or flash glucose monitoring based on individual preferences, needs, characteristics and device functionality. And actually in the guidance, it has some really nice, um, you know, uh, more notes about what kind of things we would look for. So, you know, is it for occupational reasons? Is it for hypos? That kind of thing. So they have got some really good um, notes on there about which one to use. Um, and we should use shared decision making to identify the person's needs and preference to offer the appropriate device. It does also say in there that where multiple devices meet the person's needs, then we should choose the one with the least cost available. So obviously being nice that, that cost is kind of a um, something that we need to be aware of in our own clinical practice. Um, the NG28 obviously is the type 2 diabetes um, NICE guidance, and they talk about um, patients with type 2 diabetes that are on MDI so that's multiple daily injections and they do count that as anything above like on a BD mix don't they so it's BD injections up to a basal plus um, and we can offer those um, people flash glucose monitoring if they have recurrent or severe hypoglycemia impaired awareness of their hypos or their condition or disability means they can't perform um, self-monitoring of blood glucose levels, but they could perhaps use flash um, glucose monitoring to test, um, or in those where they're advised to self-test glucose um, levels at least eight times per day, or those that require perhaps third parties to help test. So that was one of the original criteria, wasn't it, yeah. from the RMOC that we spoke about. So those that perhaps need care workers or carers or other healthcare professionals to monitor their glucose for them. Um, we can also consider real-time um, continuous glucose monitoring in those patients as an alternative to flash if it's available at the same or a lower cost. So um, we'll talk about those in a bit more detail in a bit, won't we? But it's really good that we have all of these options available now for such a wide variety of patients. I think it's a really exciting time to be a DSN, actually. Um, Definitely. Yeah. So I'm going to stop sharing on here because I'm going to share a different presentation for our lovely uh, Christian because we had a bit of a tech issue in the warm up. <laughs> so Nothing I'm going to do it from my end. So I apologise <laughs> if this doesn't go to plan. Um, I'll do my best Boris Johnson impression and say next slide when, when yeah, you're please do. Please do. <laughs> uh, right, I've got share sound, I've got optimize, I'm going for it, I'm going. Right, share from beginning. Okay, go. <laughs> uh, so yeah, and as, as I introduced myself earlier, I'm Christian, um, product manager at Glucoman. So I've got about 10 minutes today or so, and I'll be covering the perspective of what the new NICE guidance means for patients living with diabetes. So next slide, please. To get a true perspective or patient's perspective, I'll start off by showing this clip from Nikki Breslin, a well-known diabetes advocate, explaining what this all means to her and her peers. So give it a whirl. I'm gonna press play. Hi, I'm Nikki. Uh, type 1 diabetes and I have been attempting some kind of friendship for around 21 years now. The recent update to the NICE guidance for me and everyone else living with or impacted by diabetes is, and I'm really sorry to repeat what's just been said so many times, literally life changing. Um, Personally, for me, it means I am able to continue using the CGM, which was just invaluable during my pregnancy with Felix, particularly um, being unable to. I don't know if that's frozen there, Amanda. Oh, hang on two seconds. Where's to go into yeah. my, my clinic. Um, so for me to assess and also for them to be able to see what was going on um and and just sort of tweak things during pregnancy was was invaluable and made such a big difference it's also been so useful because as a result of that pregnancy i had a reduction in my hypo awareness and um the the cgm being able to continue using that has just given me more confidence i think in trying to prevent hypos and hypers actually um 
and certainly more confidence than when I was using flash um, when I was pregnant with Tabitha because the flash I used at the time didn't alarm um, and quite occasionally I'd, I'd get some accuracy issues but I just found that whilst I could still be more proactive than with finger pricks alone I'm not able to be as proactive with flash as I am with CGM. Um, so having a continuous glucose monitor means I feel I'm able to play a more active part in living life than I think I would without it. I feel I'm able to keep my kids safe because I can keep myself safe. I can, um, I've got a better chance of keeping my BGs steady and outside of that really high or really low range. Um, because I can just look at my CGM at a glance, I have it on my watch or my phone, it takes a moment, um, which then means any reactions or, or pro-actions that I need to put in place, just overall it's taking less time out of my day. Um, and it obviously reduces the need for finger pricking. Um, I still like to do a finger prick when I wake up in the morning. Um, I still finger prick before driving or when I've got that sort of rapid change happening or if my CGM doesn't um, reflect how I'm feeling. Um, and it just gives me, I suppose the finger prick that still gives me some reassurance that everything's working as it should and that, that they're reading correctly but also it um it means that I feel less bothered about finger pricking when it's absolutely necessary because I can see I can see the bigger picture I can see what's happening between between the lines and I know that that's all that's all go you know doing what it's meant to what I'm working really hard for it to do. Access to all types of diabetes technology really does broaden the possibilities of different management techniques for the future, which is always just so, so exciting a prospect for everyone living with diabetes because it promises a better quality of life it decreases the the mental load of living with uh, a long-term condition. And also, I suppose it makes that sense of having an unwanted full-time job a little bit less unbearable. Um, on a daily basis for me, the ability to be more proactive in my diabetes management because of the CGM means that I'm actually getting the most out of my insulin pump features as well even though the two are not connected is that gone again did in any way this new guidance brings the prospect of more time to be mama wifey freelancer housekeeper chef Taxi driver, washerwoman, best friend. <laughs> All before I need to be a pancreas impersonator. And I think if nothing else, the last two years has highlighted how precious time and good Mama. quality of life really is. Mama. That leads us to the next slide. Hi, I'm Nikki, uh, type 1 diabetes and I have... <laughs> We'll get um, the end. Yeah, so Nikki highlighted there the reality of living with diabetes, even with the great new cha changes to the um, NICE guidance. Can you click, please? The reality is that patients fully embrace the advancements to true CPM over flash with its benefits to quality of life, time and range, and real-time customizable alerts, which is something we look to fully support with our Glucoman Day CGM that patients can benefit from now through um, HCTED or via the drug, drug tariff via, um, from September onwards. Along with this, um, it's significantly reducing the environmental footprint versus similar systems. Another click, please. 
Although patients will be using CGMs more regularly moving forward, this does not mean, however, that blood glucose testing should be forgotten about, as patients will still see um, blood glucose testing as a complement to CGM usage in times where perhaps CGMs are warming up or experiencing signal loss. Many patients will still need to use blood glucose testing to confirm hypos, hypers, or times of rapid change, especially around driving and other activities. Also, patients require both advice via blood glucose readings. So click. Um, which can now be garnered via apps such as our Glucolog Rapid Count, which links seamlessly free of charge with our ARIO glucose meters, where patients can adjust bolus advice based off what they're doing in their everyday life, such as exercise, recent hypos, alcohol consumption, or importantly, periods of illness. Click, which is a time when it is essential for patients to be equipped with a fully functional ketone testing device like our ARIO 2K dual meter to fit in with a nice guidance that still says that patients living with type 1 diabetes should still have access to such testing. Next slide, please. So as you can see, Glucomin offers a total diabetes solution for these everyday realities. Like the products I previously mentioned in the last slide, through to our patient download softwares and apps, insulin pen needles, and our upcoming Glucomin Day patch pump, which will link with our Glucomin Day CGM by early next year. Next slide, please. And speaking of our CGM, we, provide, we pride ourselves in the fact that Glucamin Day provides a value every minute for better treatment decisions and hypo hyper avoidance. Its insertion is completely needle free for a reduced risk of pain or bleeding. It is also the first CGM designed with the environment in mind, and both the applicator and transmitter can be reused for up to five years for a significant reduction in plastic and lithium battery waste. Plus, due to the needle free insertion, there is no need for a hefty sharps waste bin for the applicator. And all our accessories are made from recycled materials and all our packaging is recyclable. And finally, the Glucomin Day CGM is adhesive is free from isoball and acrylate, which is the, which is the allergen um, that most site reactions um, occur from with wearable technology. And as a result, Glucomin Day is very well tolerated and no site reactions are reported in our main clinical trials. Next slide. So as mentioned previously, blood glucose monitoring should be seen as an adjunct to CGM usage moving forward, and it will continue to be the gold standard of gl glucose testing um, for many who do not have a CGM device if they don't choose to go that way. That is why we have an expanding range of blood glucose meters to support patients appropriately. Our new Glucofix tech is our cost-effective blood glucose meter, which has all the features a patient and their healthcare professional would need, like fast, accurate results, which surpass ISO criteria, as well as a visible glow-in-the-dark display to view the large memory. This data can also be viewed on patient smartphones in the form of our Glucolog Lite diary app. Um, and this really goes alongside our long-standing ARIO 2K meter, which has recently undergone a price reduction for its glucose strips to just 725, making it the most cost-effective dual meter available in the UK. With this, with this in mind, click. If all patients living with type 1 diabetes not using a pump were to be upgraded to an ARIO 2K meter, then it would save the NHS an astounding 21 and a half million pounds, helping to fund further technologies for these exact same patients. Also, as I had previously mentioned, ARIO 2K um, users can benefit from our Glucolog rapid count bolus advice to ensure that they are attaining the best quality of support for everyday insulin decisions. One last slide. So in summary, Patients are keen to move forward with the latest technologies to help improve how they live with diabetes, but are aware of the possible pitfalls and pros and cons that these new pieces of kit can bring. That is why at Glucoman, we offer a total diabetes solution to fit all of these needs for all patients, whilst keeping things simple, smart, and connected. If you would like any further information about anything I've spoken about during this segment, please get in contact via any of the channels on the screen or pop a message in the chat, um, or join us in the future on any of our webinars, which I've got some examples of we've got up there on, on the screen. So once again, thanks for your time and have a great day from me and everyone at Glucomet. Thank you, that's great. I'm gonna go back to our original slides, two seconds. Mm -hmm. I'll check if we've got any questions coming in. Yeah. Oh, Kevin Fernando is watching us on Facebook. Hello, Kevin. <laughs> uh, right. This is where we were. Let's hope he can give us some primary care perspective on uh, using tech.
So now we are on to our second uh, talk of this evening from Dexcom, who are our silver sponsors. So I'm going to stop sharing and hopefully you're going to be able to share now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Don't put me in charge of it, Sam. <laughs> How's that? Yay. We're good. Everyone hear me okay? Yeah, fab. So my name's Sam, uh, I, I work for Dexcom and uh, thank you for the invite. So for the next five minutes or so, um, I want to talk through uh, Dexcom's kind of future product range, but particularly focus on uh, Dexcom 1. So as many of you will know, um, Dexcom G6 has been in the market for the last four years. Um, it has been, uh, so we launched it in June 2018. And in line with nice guidance around hypo unawareness or impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, the Dexcom G6 has been offered uh, for those patients that, uh, that fit that kind of criteria. Moving forward, Dexcom G6 is going to continue to stay in the market. Um, and the reason it's going to continue to stay is it was mentioned earlier on that uh, there are uh, many kind of closed loop studies and trials going on. But also we have a number of partners that we are currently collaborated with. Um, those partners at the moment are the Tandem T-SLIM, the, the CAM APS system, which is built out of uh, Adam Brooks Hospital. We've announced our collaboration with Omnipod, so the, the new Omnipod 5, which we hope is going to come to the UK very soon. It has launched in, in the US um, and Ipsamed as well. We've also announced our collaboration with Lilly and Nova Nordisk with their connected pens. So for the time being, until it allows the time for our pump partners to do the software updates, the G6 will continue for the, for the time being for anyone who is closed looping or using hybrid closed loops with our partners. On the right hand side of the screen, uh, many of you would, would have heard, uh, we've announced our CE marking of the Dexcom G7. So G7 uh, will be launched in the next few months. Uh, no specific date has been set as of yet. Um, anyone who is not closed looping on G6 and is currently using a G6 will be migrated as quickly and efficiently as possible to take advantage of the, uh, the benefits of kind of G7 going forward. Just kind of top line of some of those kind of benefits. So patients will still have the hypoprotective alerts on G7. The sensor and transmitter are all encompassing. They're all in one sensor and transmitter now. And the actual device is 60% smaller than, um, than G6. There's going to be just a 30 minute warm up. There's going to be a seamless transition from one sensor to the next. There's going to be an improved accuracy. So we've released pivotal trial data showing a really good accurate um, sensor. Um, and that's kind of it for, for G7 at, 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 at this moment. Um, so kind of pre 31st of March, if you like, I always talk sort of pre 31st, 31st and post 31st of March, as I've kind of alluded to, you know, patients, that had hypo unawareness or impaired awareness of hypoglycemia, which we believe affected around 20 to 25% of type ones only really had access to real time CGM. This is where Dexcom one comes in. So if we think about the other 75, 80% of the market and where Libra, so Libra one and Libra two has had an absolute dominance and stronghold. This is where we would like to also offer a real time CGM solution in that 75, 80%. So this is where Dexcom 1 uh, will be launched. So a few key things about Dexcom 1. Firstly, you'll probably see from the picture that it is built off of the Dexcom G6. So it has the same applicator, sensor and transmitter. It has the same accuracy, same multiple um, insertion areas of the belly, abdomen, back of the arm. It has the same accuracy, the same licensing from the age of two, up, two and upwards. But it's a more simplified version. It's a more simplified CGM device. And what I mean by that is it won't have the hypo predictive alerts that you get from our G series, from our G6 and G7. OK, the other thing that it won't have is the share and follow feature, which you get with particularly kind of appropriate for pediatric patients where they want to share their data in real time with up to 10 people, which you will have on the G6 and G7. But what it is still is a real time CGM device giving you data every single five minutes. But the big thing about Dexcom 1 is firstly, it is approved to be listed on drug tariff from August the 1st this year. So that's the first thing. The second thing about Dexcom 1 is it's going to be priced at £900 per year. So those of you know Libra 1 and Libra 2, it is priced exactly the same as Libra 1 and Libra 2. 
it is also now going to be on drug tariff on fp10 for you to be able to access it in exactly the same way as you do libra one and libra two so what we are asking you now is where you've thought of a patient that is appropriate for libra one or libra two is to consider the real-time cgm benefits over flash technology One of the new features that we will be that will be on the Dexcom one is something called the delay first high alert. So when we think about um, patients that are suffering from, from hyperglycemia or spending time um, above range, this will really help those patients. So this um, this feature uh, gives a, a window of opportunity to set the high alert at whatever they want and then set a delay feature of anywhere between 15 minutes and four hours. So if I give you an example, if you look at the picture on the left hand side, so this patient has set their high alert at 10. They've then um, bolused insulin on board and actually the insulin has done what we wanted it to do because it's corrected and the glucose level has dropped within that hour and therefore the alert hasn't gone off. If you look over to the right hand side of the page, the same, the glucose level or the high alert is set at 10 but actually the insulin hasn't done what we wanted it to do. And the glucose level has stayed above 10 for over an hour. That triggers the high alert to go off. So this means that high alert now is more actionable in the way that it works. And it means that the patient actually has, um, can actually do something about it. Historically with some of the other CGM devices, the high alert is, really kind of set around about sort of 13 or 14 in lots of cases and actually potentially kind of too high. Um, so this allows more flexibility um, and like I said, more, more of an actionable alert. And just finally, um, we've got lots of education, lots of training, lots of modules, lots of webinars, um, but to access more information, we do have a designated HCP website that you can see the address there. You can also access the healthcare professional website via our main website page in the top right hand corner. There's a link to the uh, HCP uh, website. Um, and also, I'd, I'd ask all of you to, to reach out to your local Dexcom reps um, to find out more information about our full range of CGM devices, particularly kind of Dex1, given that um, it's going to be included on drug tariff from, from the 1st of August. Just finally, we probably also ask for some of your help with regards to um, allowing kind of access for Dexcom 1. So um, looking at some of the pathways um, would be really, really useful to understand from your perspective, your localities, ICSs uh, and CCGs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sam, that's great. Who you could, can you stop sharing? Yeah, brilliant. So Path has arrived, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Partha. So we've got sort of about 10 minutes for anything that you want to talk about, Partha, and then we'll just open the floor for a panel discussion. So I'll, I'll, I'll hand over. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay now? It's, it's a yeah. bit quiet, but... Is it not any better? Okay. Okay. Um, hopefully you can hear me, but in short, I think what I would say is that they, they, you know, this is a great opportunity. Uh, we've had a long journey as to where we are. And uh, as Beth and Amanda mentioned, and I, think, I, I think I'm going to start off also by saying thank you to the DSN Forum because they have been fantastic allies in this whole journey, wherever they work locally, as well as trying to push the whole issue. And that's been very, very welcome. Um, and the journey started in 2017, November, as somebody said, we are here now, 2022, after lots of ups and downs. And, and I always say that uh, with any technology, there are four groups of people, and that's where we are. You know, group one who adapted it straight away, people like Darby, uh, which is one of the reasons Darby is at, uh, so if you look at the uptake, let's just take Flash as an example, as your bar barometer of starting point. Uh, Coventry, Darby, there are nearly 80, 85% of the population have got a Flash glucose monitor. Uh, and then the second group was <laughs> basically <laughs> waiting for more uh, evidence that came on board. Hampshire, probably myself, that would be that sort of area. Then you have a lot of people who jump in because everybody else is doing it. And you get the rest of people coming in. And finally, you have people who have always uh, fought with it. And they've always found a reason why. And then first of all, we need more evidence. Then it's we need more uh, 
real world data, then we need better pricing, then we need nice. Uh, I suspect uh, they will always find a reason. But having said that, if you look at the areas which have been problematic from the very beginning, Cambridge, uh, Norfolk, all those areas, they're starting to move now as well, so, which is great. You know, I think, uh, you know, even the lowest areas are close to 50 percent. And that's great, you know, where we started off. And so that's all I have to say. I and mean, I think I would just say the thank you to every single person who's come on the call, who is helping out, who's trying their best. And, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a new future. We have had flash and now we've got uh, <coughs> options of continuous glucose monitors. The market keeps evolving. It's a bit like I always say that it's a bit like uh, for the world of type 1 diabetes. Those of you know my love towards Marvel comics, <clears throat> I always say this is like the Marvel universe is building up to the final movie, you know, the final movie of Thanos and the rest. So our final movie for the world of type 1 diabetes is closed loops. And this is all the little sort of stories which adds up to it. So next year, next year could be even more exciting, interesting. Um, but, you know, in the middle of that, we've got financial challenges, we've got workforce challenges. So those are all things to bear in mind as well. And I think you know, if this is recorded and goes out to patients, I also ask them to bear in mind all the challenges and, you know, that we all have. But I think finally, I would say is that it's not on and this morning for yesterday, I was with the East of England. Today, I was with Southwest England. And one of the things I said to them, forget the rest of the country, even in your own region, you've got massive variations, you know, forget about everybody else. So the difference between, for example, Cornwall and Bath is about 30%. And I've said that that can't be right. That just can't be right. Those are the things you need to tackle, even within your region. So let's see. I think I'm, I'm you know, and I'll finish with this. You know, we got 60 at last count. To end of May, we had nearly 66% of the type 1 population on flash. We got about 11%, 12% on CGM. So that's more than 75% of your population on some form of non, you know, non glucose, you know, traditional, which is fantastic. That's, data which lots of countries would struggle to replicate so a big thank you to everybody for that so that's my little spiel so it gives you some time back as well so happy to take any questions or whatever the panel wants etc that, that sounds less daunting actually doesn't it saying 75 percent of people have access to tech does sound quite less daunting because i know when the nice guidance came out every dsm was like how are we going to get everybody on it but if we've got so many people on it then it's nearly it does sound less scary I, I think one thing i would say International data in markets where it's all open, uh, roughly saturates around about 75 to 80, because they'll all, you all know, there will always be patients who do not want it, due to many reasons. Yeah. And 75 to 80 is market saturation. And so we're not very far off. I think now it's these gentlemen on our call, they will all sort of, uh, you know, battle within each other and quite rightly too. And that's what market is about and go forth and prosper and convince clinicians and make the best product win is all I say. <laughs> I think there's room for lots of different products, isn't there? I mean, I've tried quite a few different CGMs and Flash and whatnot, and not, not everyone is right for every person, is it? So it's nice that we have all the different ones that we can choose which one's right for us. I mean, some people get rashes to different things and yeah. or, you know, different Options devices work with different things. So it's really good that we've got choice. Um, so we've got loads of questions already. We've got about 70 people live on the Zoom and we've got about 20 uh, on and off on Facebook. So it's about 80 people watching at the moment. So I'm sure once we start the questions, they'll, they'll come piling in. Um, Tamsin, did you want to read out the first the first question? Yeah, so I mean, I know you said that, um, you know, the, the, the guidance obviously has only been out three nearly four months so it, it's still very early days from that point of view um but i think obviously people are finding that their ccgs maybe are very slow to sort of come out and say yes no how what why where and all the rest of it and how do we you know how do we speed that up how do we communicate with our ccgs because i suppose that's the thing is that that's probably not a conversation that we're used to having really is talking to commissioners and things like that maybe in job roles so there, it depends as to how you see it, right? I've always said it's on prescription and there's a big advantage to it. Why do you think we set a target of 20% and then we achieved 60% with Libra? Because it was on prescription. Because most of the country didn't follow any of the guidelines we put in place, right? That's the reality of what happens when you're on prescription. 
So I had this conversation this morning with a GP colleague, uh, and I said, what would happen if you prescribe it? Do you want to prescribe this? And he said, I want to prescribe it. I said, what would happen if you prescribe it? And they said, well, they would get angry. And, and, and what would they do? Would they take your job away? What would they do? And I think I always say to people, if you're doing what is right for the patient, what you, if you're doing what is evidence-based, if you're doing what NICE is back, there is no single person in the NHS who can stand against you. The maximum they can say is wait for us to make a decision, right? So at about the six month mark, I, all, I mean, people have already seen me do that. I've always said to people, prescribe at will. Anybody gives you grief, copy me in. It's quite simple. And it, it has an effect because I think everybody tends to sort of back off very quickly whenever I'm involved. So I, I've always said, I have no issues with taking on people. You're doing the right thing for patient. You're not doing something. I could, so I can understand when people used to say with flash, oh, the evidence isn't there and we need to do more. Okay. We didn't push hard. We said, fine, if it doesn't meet the right criteria we set, I'm not going to go and push. That debate is over. So, for example, this morning, somebody said, we need to do a business case. And I said, you don't need to do a business case because the cost effectiveness work is done by NICE. Are you telling me you're more qualified than NICE? You're not. And they said, that's true. I said, there you go. So there's no business case. You do have a business case when you want to justify having a consultant, a nurse, a pharmacist. I get all that. You don't have a business case. And if you want to do a business case on this nice guidance, I want to see everybody's business case on SGLD2 inhibitors on the nice I guidance. I need to say that. <laughs> I haven't seen a single business case on that. Why is it that everybody needs a business case with technology? And I've, mm. I've said this ever since I started this role. One of the main things I say about this role, and that's what might be my fundamental thing, is that we don't pay, we haven't paid enough attention to type 1 diabetes in the NHS for years. And it's time to change. We are changing it. And Today, the national audit data has come out in type 1. We've got the best results ever since records began in the last 16 years. There's a reason for it. We're mm -hmm. pushing tech. Tech is your answer. And that's not all the answer, but, you know, if we are going to dish out SGLD2 inhibitors that have not, nothing against the product, it's a fantastic product like chips, then we do the same for this too. Straightforward as that. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, what else questions have we got? Um... So there's one here about um, people with type 2 diabetes. What would you do in regards to follow-up for suitable patients with type 2 diabetes who cannot manage their flash as it's labour-intensive in primary care? So I think they probably mean maybe the experience of the staff in primary care and the yeah. follow-up rather than the patient themselves. So I think there are two phases to this work. I think there's type 1 and type 2 should not be lumped together in the rollouts of technology, right? you should finish the journey with type one, but I think there should be a much, much smoother trajectory into introducing into type two. I think there needs to be training, there needs to be people being more comfortable with the use of CGM flash, and quite rightly, primary care do the bulk of uh, type two, will be nervous about it. So I think there needs to be a lot of training before it's, a, and I think <coughs> giving the example, uh, you know, SGLT2 inhibitor didn't just roll out on day one or dpp 4s It needs to happen with training. People need to be comfortable. You need to look at it exactly that way, right? And finally, also, people need to look at the NICE guidance very, very carefully. The, in type 1, the evidence base is that it reduces HbA1c, reduces DKA, improves quality of life, right? So it basically does everything you want in somebody with type 1 diabetes, CGM, flash, whatever. In type 2, it is about event management. It's not necessarily about everything else. This is about event management, i.e. reduction of hospital admissions like hypos, et cetera, which we know anecdotally. So I think choose your patients, and I think it's a gradual sort of rollout as it will be. But I think industry will need to help because we, you know, everybody will need to help in upskilling primary care, just like other industry colleagues have done with SGLD2, GLP1, DPP4. The philosophy is the same. So slow as she goes, I would say, get more people onto it. Finish the journey with type one because you've got so many people on it. People are comfortable. And there also one more reason I say to everybody, <coughs> finish the journey with type one. It's because if you've got closed loops coming next year, you don't want to be caught on the back foot, right? You want to have people on sensors, right? So then you can change them to the relevant tech if you need a step up. What do you do if NICE tomorrow turns around and says, listen, you've got type one. You've got, people know my preferred position. I've said that very clearly. This is what I want. I want people with type one to have CGM or a flash at diagnosis. And if that's not working for them, they then go on to a loop. And that's it. There's no other steps. 
There's nothing else, there's no criteria, nothing. That's the holy grail. What happens if NICE says that? Because the system ain't ready for that. So that's that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I, Diabetes Technology Network, for anybody who is maybe primary care and not really au fait with tech, have done loads of training, haven't they, with Gluco. Um, I know you guys put all of that together when it was started being said, DSMs don't know enough and we need to do training and stuff. So all of that, there's a huge amount of modules on there that people can go and do in their own time, which is amazing. Um, and mm -hmm. It's not that scary. Hours. We learn. <laughs> but you've already, you've already done it. You know, there's 75 percent of type one on it, right? Mm. You have done it. It's not like consultants sat in an office and given it out. You all have already done it, and I think that's what yeah. I keep on saying. You've already done a huge yards. So this is not tricky. Come well, on, I'm going to yeah. steal what what Pratik says actually, because it's a bit like any new type of technology, like a new smartphone, for example. You might not know how to use it all straight away you use the basic functions to start with and then as you get used to it and this applies to both healthcare professionals and people using the the tech as you get more used to it you use it more and more and then you learn all the other features but you might not know them all straight away but it comes with time as well yeah yep that's a good one maybe and the, and the hybrid closed loop um obviously the trial fit, you know, is, is supposed to be um, releasing its data, isn't it? And uh, is that coming end of this year or is that next year? Yeah. <laughs> so, we, so we finished all the trials. The data has been analysed. We have seen the data. It's in confidence. We've gone across to NICE. We went to send it across 1st of June. 1st of June? 15th of June. Can't remember when it we did it. It's all gone. Work has started. Uh, we're all very positive. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, we finished our... I think we declared it on the 15th of June and it went out on the 16th, 15th of June, 2021. And 16th of June, I think we submitted the data. So yeah, it was fantastic. We had 870 odd patients, um, 200 odd of them are pediatrics and we've collected data from parents, children. We feel quite good, which is why, you know, I keep on saying to people, get ready, get ready now. Don't come, you know, in 2023, don't go like, I will of course say a very important point is that we are fully aware this there needs to be a workhorse with this for closed loop. Closed loop mm -hmm. is not the same as CGM or flash insertions. This is a different game altogether, which we fully appreciate. And uh, we are working on that too. So. Oh, exciting. Is there any more questions? Oh, no. Who wants to this? There's one about how to handle local resistance. Oh, yeah. <coughs> do, do medicine management trump you know, nice, which you talk about this a lot on uh, Twitter, I don't, don't you? I mean, every single area which has involved me has had their doors open. Yeah. Ask me. I'll go out and attend meetings. It's quite easy. I always say yeah. to people is that there is no way, I mean, things like when people say, ah, it's a nice guideline. We're not bound to follow it. Okay. First of all, that's false because people think that there isn't a legal precedence to it. People are not being very well advised by the legal teams is all I can say. People just need to look in the NHS and see about legal precedence. NICE guidelines has got legal precedence. I don't want to go down that road with people, number one. We want to do it, you know, in a friendly way. Um, and that's number one. Number two is think about qualies, right? If you've got a quali where uh, Sam can correct me, but uh, I think Dexcom 1 comes out as cost effective, a uh, cost saving, um, not just cost effective. If you've got an intervention which is cost saving or a quali in Libra's case, the 5K, I say to every region, I tell you what, open your finances to me I'll, in 30, 30 minutes and I'll find you the money. Mm. It's quite simple because CCGs will be funding stuff with a quali of 10K, 15K, because 20K is your threshold, right? For justifying taxpayers' money. If you can't fund something, then you just stop something which is worth 15K and fund something which is 5K. That's even better utilization of taxpayers' money. It will take me 30 yeah. minutes to find the money. So We've been asked in a, um, a local area that I know, uh, can we you know, come up with cost savings somewhere else? And we, we all said, well, what, can we just stop prescribing DPP force? <laughs> because no, I, the amount of that, drugs we give out to... Uh... It's not even that. But that, that's silly because they're looking at cost saving in a financial year. 
that's not how yeah. any budgets work. And time. when CC, so CCGs and medicines management, those who want, let me make it very clear, majority, vast majority of medicines management have been incredibly helpful. That's a fundamental thing. The ones who resist it will always try and find the reason. And what they do know is a lot of clinicians don't know the loopholes to it, right? So when they say to you, what are the cost savings? The answer is, that's what NICE did. Why are you asking me? <laughs> right? You are not supposed to be answering those questions. Why do you think NICE exists? NICE exists to justify what is a cost saving and make recommendations. It is not, that is why NICE have got experts. We are not experts in cost saving calculations. That's not our job. So the answer is read the nice document. It says there if it's cost saving or not. It's quite simple. Yeah, we've got a question on um, Facebook that says, so if we can prescribe Dexcom 1, which will be on prescription, and we've also got Libre and the other options that are on prescription, will we still have to do IFR requests for Dexcom G6 and 7? Right, so there are lots of commercially sensitive uh, discussions going on with relevant companies, which I am <coughs> not privy to reveal. But at the moment, we are trying to make life easier. I think, as you can see, we have made life easier with technology. Dexcom 1, you know, Glucomen, all the coming, uh, Flash. And let's see what the future holds. For the time being, G6, G7, Libra 3, they all sit on a separate lot, which is about the yeah. usual pathway of having to justify. And yes, it's IFR, it's a bit pain. What I think we need to consider is that the Dexcom 1 or the Glucomen, does it provide everything that parents want? It may be suitable. Mm -hmm. I'm not answering that question right now, but that's the question. If it doesn't, do we need to give them higher? Because it's very important to remember the parents in this equation who have got kids with type 1. Adults, fundamentally different, right? So I have got already got a lot of questions going, I'm sorry, but I want the G6. So my question, why do you want the G6? What is it that you want in it? Oh, I want it because I don't have to scan. I'll have the Dexcom 1 then. Well, I want it because I want to loop. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that till NICE says so. So you may want it, but we can't fund it on taxpayers. So that's the argument. So you need to have a really good reason as to, for example, Glucoman has got a product, works very well, environmentally conscious. All You have those options on the table. And I think what we should do is you know, have a nice little menu list with all the plus minuses. Let the patients choose. Oh, that's so a nice on that note, <laughs> we do actually have oh, a, a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he it's knew. Like you knew. Yeah. I cannot believe this. So uh, we have done a little uh, grid uh, which shows all of the CGMs. We've kind of highlighted ones in green that are either on drug tariff or about to go on drug tariff. Um, so I just want to. Play it so it's on the big screen hang on so you can see it so this is kind of what we've come up with so far so this is brand new hot off the press right this second you're the first guys to see this so please tell me if there's anything wrong and we'll change it <laughs> but we've had it on assurance from uh, the diabetes technology yeah. network they've had a look at it Parth has had a look at it we've had a look at it we think all it's the all companies have had a look at it it's yeah all happen. companies have had a look at it so we're, we're hoping it's absolutely 100 but you know these things always change but at the moment this is what we think um is the sort of comparison so if if there is something that's really important for you you know like like Partha was saying if, if you are a parent like I, I'm a parent um of a, ch a child with type one so I have to have that follow-up because otherwise I'm not going to get woken up at night if um if he's hypo uh because he doesn't wake up <laughs> um so all those all those kind of things that are important this this will show you so what we'll do is if you're watching this on Facebook, we'll put it into the chat. Um, if you are watching this on uh, the live Zoom, we will send it to you in an email. Anybody that's that's uh, that's registered, uh, we'll send it to you on a, on a PDF. Otherwise, contact us at uh, DSM Forum. Uh, I'm sure also we will tweet it a lot. We'll, it'll be tweeted everywhere. There's lots of GB on here, um, so I'm sure we'll tweet it a lot. Um, for so, we'll take a photo now before I stop sharing. We'll link it to our website as well. Yeah, it's going to it's going to be everywhere. So um, and it, as the other ones start to go on to drug tariff, if that if that happens, we'll we'll change those ones uh, to green. <laughs> but I'm going to stop sharing in about two seconds. Are we ready? Stop share. Mm -hmm. so, um, a final we've got three minutes left. So a final uh, word from our, our sponsors. Sam, do you want to say something? 
just thank you very much for inviting me to the forum. I've really enjoyed sitting in and um, hope you've all enjoyed listening to, um, you know, what Dexcon's got coming. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Christian? Yeah, same as Sam. Um, and as Arthur said as well, um, there's a plethora of products now for choice, which is great moving forward. So, yeah. Absolutely. And I really like your environmental um, impact because I think that's that's becoming more and more um, in people at people's forefront of people's mind, isn't it? And not not, not yep. so much plastic in the oceans and all of that yep. stuff. <laughs> we love that. that. You're sat behind or in front of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Beth, any final words from you? No, I just I'm really excited to see where everything's going. Like I said, it's a really exciting time to be a DSN, and we're stuck in the middle of all of these uh, exciting products. So. Jesus knows where we will be in the end of our career. Everything we'll will have it all implanted. I think <laughs> yeah. it'll be crazy, but it's really exciting. So yeah, we'll we'll carry on the uh, the good fight for it, won't we? <laughs> Tamsin, any any final words from you? Um, no, I think I just I totally agree with uh, what everybody said. I think it's a really you know positive time almost to sort of have diabetes if that is positive in a sense you know I have diabetes so I think you know it's okay in a sense for me to say that um and uh, you know I use a hybrid, hybrid closed loop system and you know it's an absolute game changer for me um you know it's it's helped me so much so um you know to be able to you know offer that to somebody else who's got diabetes and actually make their lives easier to live with is you know just an amazing thing to do really yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Uh, Vicky? Yeah, no, I agree. It's really exciting. And I think we've all got the shared common goal, haven't, here, haven't we here? We're all, we all want the best for our patients. Um, and I've got a big passion about um, training and education, and that's part of what I do in my role. So there's lots of obviously resources out there for people maybe working in primary care who um, aren't feeling that confident about it all. But um, obviously there's the DTN um, Academy and their website and then the Eden team are doing um, a national piece um, for all primary um, healthcare professionals to try and sort of improve knowledge and confidence and sort of um, just spread training and, and awareness really. Partha, final say. Um, I'm just going to say a couple of things is that don't ever forget what who we're doing this for right and I think in front of you that patient in your head needs to be your loved one or yourself and I don't say that glibly and I say that with, and if you were sitting in there with, and you had type one diabetes, and if the answer is, yeah, I would want that, then nothing else mm -hmm. should stop you from doing that, right? And when people go like, the system stops me, well, I'm at the top of the system and I'm telling you, please prescribe it will, right? Anybody else who stops you is not doing the right thing for people with type one diabetes. So you are always in the right when you prescribe it. And if you're in the right, there is nobody who can challenge you for that. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Papa. That's really helpful for people. I think they'll feel a lot more reassured when they uh, <laughs> just prescribe it to everybody. <laughs> within reason, within reason, guys. <laughs> I'm biased as well, though. So, you know. Yeah, um, we've got a lot of biased people. <laughs> definitely. 50% of the DSN forum are on CGM slash flash <laughs> so <laughs> cool okay then i'm gonna say goodbye to our our live stream on facebook i'm just gonna stop the live stream now so goodbye for facebook, Bye, facebook. <laughs> so we're off live stream on facebook and and um, thank you to all of you guys on zoom that, uh, are, that joined us today thank you so much for coming um and yeah that's the end of our of our show so thank you very much and uh We'll see you. We'll see you again on the next one. <laughs>